Hello everyone, my name is Latfi, it's like a sneeze, Latfi. And uh, I'm founder of Yiki, it's, uh, we're a partner of uh, SoCap, a media platform, so we're making accessible to everyone the possibility to create community video campaigns. And when SoCap asked me to join the team on hosting the conversation around smart contract, just make sure you're at the right place, smart contracts, blockchain technology as a blended finance tool. I said, okay, that's gonna be not geek, it's gonna be really, really close to the reality and to the, to the field. So we have three great uh, speakers and they know they're really on the field on it, aren't investing on it. So we're gonna have a, a great conversation. So without further ado, I'm gonna ask you to introduce yourself in just two or three words, no, no, sentences. And at the same time, we're gonna go up into uh, the question, what is smart contract for us <laughs> in a simple way? So if you can introduce each other briefly. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Hopefully we have some coffee in us after the afternoon <laughs> slump after lunch. My name is Antoinette Marie. I'm the director of Heifer Labs. We're a digital technology support unit within an INGO called Heifer International, working with smallholder farmers in Asia, Africa, Americas, and the US. My team's role is to work hand in hand with our country and our regional leaders, looking at their programming and determining how digital solutions can help them accelerate and achieve their impact through intentional and locally led programmatic integration. It's really a pleasure to be here. Hello, I'm Gabriela Chang, co-founder of EthiHub. I am an industrial designer. I work for the Secretary of Economic Development in Chiapas in Mexico, and I was also an organic coffee producer. In EthiHub, what we do is to enable that anyone in the world can become an impact investor. And the funding, the crowd lending platform we developed five years ago enables that smallholder farmers get access to affordable financing to improve the living standards. This is connecting Global South with Global North in a win-win arbitrage. And we also, well, we'll talk about uh, that later. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. I'm Matthew Stotts with Cerulean Ventures. Um, Cerulean Ventures is a very early stage technology investment fund. Our focus is putting nature and social impact into the global economy. Um, and we do that via uh, software and technology investments. Um, our background is in, uh, in partially in, in blockchain and in other uh, globally distributed uh, internet powered uh, software systems. So you might know that as anything you've ever subscribed to and and receive uh, uh, over the internet. Um, and our we're actually investors in, in Ethic Hub, and we're glad to be partnered with uh, with Heifer as well. And so, um, looking forward to getting into the into the conversation today. Anybody knows about smart contracts or use smart contracts? Raise your hand. Good, so that's good that we have a little bit and we don't. So we're gonna go clarification of vocabulary. So like, what is smart contract for you in a simple way that people that are not known on the system? How can I use this and look good to my wife or people around me? What is smart contract? I would say first, what's blockchain? Because smart contracts run on blockchain. Okay, in a very that. simple line, blockchain is a warranty that data has not been tampered with. In a blockchain, uh, and sorry, in a smart contract, it's an um, executable agreement. It's a program that executes uh, the agreement between the parties. And when this, is, this program is locked into the blockchain, it becomes also immutable and cannot be tampered with. I don't know if that was too geeky. I hope it was <laughs> sound more normal. Good, everybody can repeat it. <laughs> Good. So, we can, <laughs> so when we say in the title, like, how can it be blended in finance? How do you say that? What, what does it mean? How can it be blended in finance? I think we can talk a little bit about our partnership here, and, and that'll help to clarify. Heifer International, Heifer Impact Capital, which is our impact investing unit, Heifer Labs, and Ethic Hub have partnered in Mexico in order to deploy a $450,000 revolving facility through Ethic Hub in support of agriculture, smallholder farmers, in coffee. 
And so I want to pass it over to Gabriella a little bit to talk about that structure. But I will say that in order to support innovation such as a blended finance tool via smart contract, there is the requirement of the facility to be supported and for there to be boots on the ground that can help ensure that the recipient of the funds is ready, they have intake, and they have the capacity to run their business. That's fundamental. Before we get into blockchain, before we get into smart contracts, that the business is viable and that they're supported through the innovation and through the processes of running their own business. Okay. So again, blended finance. What is most of you are familiar, for those who are not, blended finance is concessional capital that is willing to absorb first losses. So other investors are willing to impact invest because they know if there is a default or a loss, it will, it will be absorbed by the other side. In our case, did you know that one quarter of the world population is excluded from the traditional financial system? 70% of our farmers. This means one fifth of the world population is producing one third of our food and yet they remain poor because they don't have access to the system. So at Ethihub, what we build is two platforms that complement each other. One is a lending platform, a crowd lending platform where everyone, everybody can lend working capital. And the other one, it's a uh, blended finance. It's a crowd collateral where anyone can contribute to abort collateral on behalf of the, the farmers because they don't have. As a simple example, 80% of the coffee in the world, and coffee is one of the biggest commodities traded, 80% is in the hands of people with only two hectares of land. That's not a valid collateral because no one would grab those two hectares in the middle of nowhere. It has no valid commercial value. So because they lack collateral to access the system, that's one of the main reasons, also living very far away, also not having connectivity, not having data. But when third parties stake collateral on behalf of them, this blended finance attracts more impact investing. Because you don't know farmers are very good payers. You don't know maybe, but the global default for long-term farmers is less than 3%. But people mix this up with the default for microfinance, which is 37, 36% for consumption. So it's, it's a different thing. Because you don't know they are good payers, we have to provide you the comfort that if they don't pay you, we have something, a liquid collateral, to come in and cover your, your investment. We're very proud to say that after almost five years, the platform has landed more than $4 million with less than 1% default. And even this small default, thank you, has been covered by the blended finance, by the crowd collateral we develop. And we're very proud to start scaling this solution because as Antoinette was saying, if it doesn't work, if it's not uh, doable, it doesn't make sense. We've been doing it for five years and now after our partnership with Hafer, we are confident we are going to start scaling and reaching more farmers with the solution that we implemented. And also with the support of Sir William Ventures, who has supported us to keep growing and taking the solution abroad. We are now in six countries, and this is just the starting. Just, yeah, I, mean, I think what's super um, exciting about what you were describing is just this inflection point of growth. So um, much of, of what a uh, Antoinette Marie was talking about is um, having this foundational capacity in the communities to actually take this step. It's a, to, to move to a is a digital transformation. It's doing something different than you had before. Um, most of the loan environment um, for smallhold farmers is a cash, you know, high, absurdly high rates um, if, if they can get it. And they need that, that money to actually bring uh, crops to harvest, improve their yields, um, process um, uh, coffee that they have, or if it's cassava or, or, or cocoa or other uh, other crops. So bringing this, uh, bringing this technology in just lowers all of the costs of accessing what should just be, uh, I need to bring on, you know, maybe additional equipment and hire additional laborer from my community to work with me. Um, and so when we look at the technology, we're just looking at an accelerant, something that lowers the cost, 
it can be distributed broadly and used by, by many, but it's this hard work that has been done by the Ethic Hub team over the years and with the support of Heifer that's actually now positioning Ethic Hub to, act, to expand in this way. So you have to do that work first on the ground. Um, and now that you can identify more and more opportunities, we're really excited to see this software smart contracts, blockchain, all of this stuff, we can get into the technical parts of it. But it's really just the types of tools many of us use every day to manage our lives and, and, and our finances um, in the hands of folks at scale. So really excited about that. Quick question, like uh, when you were speaking and, and also with the farmers, there's a lot of like digital literacy that we need to bring in. And also like this is so abstract for some people now, we go with the farmers and how do you brought them on board and make sure that they, they really understood and it's not like a scam or something like that. Like there's a lot of work behind it that was done. So uh, how this happened uh, on getting on this? I think it's worth mentioning that we are working with organized producers. Um, these are cooperatives that have a level of literacy. They have a level of digitization that already exists. Of course, there's training that comes alongside the implementation, not only technical training in order to support their operations, but things like digital literacy training, training around smart, um, hot wallets and getting onboarded into the Ethic Hub platform. And there's a bit of a conversation as well about on and off ramps. So how do we go from a cryptocurrency or digital currency into pesos that can be readily used in country. And the reality is that it's already being used in country. There is already cryptocurrency exchanges, mobile penetration, data penetration. That's an enabling factor to the adoption of technologies such as this one, such as the platform with Ethic Hub. And the key is ensuring that the access to the on and the off ramps is as simple and as easy as possible. And that there is, when we're implementing with a partner like Ethic Hub, there is support with people on the ground who can facilitate that transition. The first time is always the most difficult, but oftentimes we're finding that the producers that we work with, they already have wallets. They're already working through exchanges. They're already ha they already have tested out cryptocurrency. They're curious about it and that really helps. But the continued support on the ground is a big enabling factor. And I would like to add to that, that we have proof that farmers can benefit from the technology even if they don't interact with it. Because the more evolved uh, cooperatives, they have this literacy, they have a uh, connectivity. But most of the farmers we work with, they don't have data because they don't have connectivity. So the technology enables to create the proper incentive loops for everybody, every stakeholder, do what is best for them because it is what is best for the system. And regarding technology and how we explain it for them, we don't. It's like, I, I like, I like uh, to say this example about uh, WhatsApp. Any of you know how WhatsApp works? I don't mean how to use it. We all know how to use it. But any of you know how it works? We don't. We only need to know how it is used. It's the same with the smart contracts and the wallets. You only give them the account, and in this case, I would like to clarify. Is the representative of the cooperative the ones who manages the funds? In the future, we expect the farmers to receive the wallet, the funds themselves. But in this moment, it's all carried by one guy, one woman, that is the legal representative of the cooperative, and they register the bank account of the cooperative with the account in the exchange. In the case of Mexico, it's Bitso, it's a well-known exchange. So they receive the funds from the smart contract, and the smart contract, I would like to set an example, it's kind of a scroll. You don't need a third party to receive the funds because they are in this scroll, and it's only uh, retrievable by the cooperative account because this is registered in the smart contract. The money is only for that cooperative. You cannot uh, change the, 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 the sign. So it's, it's through the existing organizational systems that we are already reaching, reaching the farmers. And yeah, as, as uh, Antoinette said, uh, we, we count on people that is uh, accompanying them online in the present if it's necessary. And the first time is difficult. But when you have so much difficulty in your life, 
opening a wallet and opening a, uh, an account in an exchange is nothing compared to their day-to-day -day difficulties. I think it's worth mentioning um, just the context here about how, I mean, Heifer came with almost half a billion dollars. This is a big commitment for, I'm sorry, half a million dollars. This is a really big commitment. <laughs> sorry. Whoa, um, take a couple zeros I, out of there. I'm very aspirational. Maybe next that. year. Very aspirational. Um, so you have to look at the context of, of what's been accomplished here from an impact investing platform. So this is where I get very excited about what Ethic Hub has built. Um, in uh, just over five years, $4 million um, in loans to farmers with an incredibly high repayment rate, in fact, an almost impossibly high re repayment rate. And Bank of America is not seeing repayment rates like this at 1% 1, 1 uh, default, which is incredible. Um, and that it took a crowd of impact investors, any of folks can go on the internet and find Ethic Hub and participate in this. That groundswell of support actually brought the big funder to the table. And I think that is as an impact in as an impact investing model is super interesting to look at. Part of that was the technology, the fact that you can actually put these um, pieces of software out into the world. They are immutable. They do not change. They, they function exactly as they're described and they do the job they're supposed to do. And they have built-in trust. And so as they get used more and more, all of a sudden, my $100 donation or loan, if you will, um, gets backed by a large organization like Heifer. And we hope to see more of this um, as the platform takes off. I, I love this slogan within the SOC app, at the speed of trust. So we're doing impact investing at the speed of trust. And the first tranche was very difficult because we have to earn the, the trust of the farmers by providing them the money we said at the rates we said and connecting all pieces. And for us, it's a huge, uh, uh, so it's a huge thing that we count now on such a huge NGO at such a big institution as Hafer International because this will open the doors to other entities. Imagine what it is to work in the intersection of impact and Web3 and blockchain. This is like talking of carnivores and vegans, you know? <laughs> it's quite complicated because the crypto bros don't want to know anything that is not algorithmic, that is related to real world. And I think farmers are poor, so they are not an opportunity. And when we talk with most of the impact investors that are very traditional, of course Web3 is not within their investment thesis. Of course not, because they think it's speculative and all the things that we see in the press because it's, it's a very early stage. But the real value is this. Imagine some years ago, if someone told you that you need not to be in, in, in the internet. Nowadays, you don't exist if no one can look for you into Google Maps. It's the same thing is going to happen with blockchain. It's very important to understand the huge consequences of this technology used for real world problems, to solve them in a sustainable and regenerative way. Let me just add something to close that off. You might be wondering, well, how did we generate that trust between Heifer International and Ethic Hub? We didn't focus on the blockchain. We didn't focus on the smart contracts. We didn't focus on the cryptocurrencies. We really pitched the impact and the potential for disruption reaching last mile financing at an affordable rate for farmers. And that's what drove the decisioning. Everything else had to make sense, and we did our due diligence. But that was the core. Did the model make sense for the impact? Was it verifiable? And it was. So it's interesting because what I got from here is that you worked with the communities. We have the leaders on the ground that can work with the farmers so they can, so you, you build over there. Uh, you don't talk about how the bike is built, but let's ride the bike. So that's that's the second element you said, and also like how the technology is re strong and 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 a great tool for those kind of impact that we're having. So those are the three, and after that you were able to create traction of investments from small investors, showing that there's a case, and after that. Uh, uh, we got a lack of juice coming out from the big organization coming in for the five billion. That's near now. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> it's gonna come. Two questions we got here that's really interesting. It's and it came to my mind too. Is um, what's the interest 
rate? Like, what are the terms that you're offering for the small farmers when you say, like, it's really affordable? Mm -hmm. So what are, uh, what are those rates? Well, I would like to point out that the Inter-American Bank for Development was our first institutional investors, investor, and they said no one had reached at commercial rates below 50%. And we were lending in those years at 20%. Now we are at 16%. And this 16% is like 70 times less than what they used to pay. The, this profile of farmers were taking money from shark loans are 18, 19, and even over 100% interest. So this 16% is divided. 8% for the impact investors, the lenders. 4% to feed the system within the, the blockchain. I won't talk that technically. And the other 4% are fees. So we said we are regenerative finance because we generate more value than the one we extract. The farmer earns more, wins more, the lender also. But because we are a scalable uh, technology, we can reach millions of farmers. And this small fee, it's enough to make it sustainable. Um, what were the, someone's going to start building a project like this and wants to integrate it. What are like the pitfalls that you face that you want them to face? Like if they do it, like what did you face is, hey, watch for this. These are the flag, red flags that if I knew before, I will not. <laughs> First of all, fall in love with the problem, not with the solution. Figure it out what are you wanted to solve, what's the, the market fit of what you're doing before going into building into the blockchain because it's expensive, it's small, because this is still an early stage. So for us, that would be uh, the, the first learning. We start building before validating. Fortunately, what we <laughs> built was usable since the beginning, but it takes time. So I would invite you, like, there are a lot of blockchain educational branches now doing that, but part of our job, part of our aim is also to spread word about the technology. We've been working for five years on it, so if we can help you, please reach out and, and we can discuss the, the models and see how can we help you to, to adopt this technology for your purposes. From a programmatic perspective, design with your partners as early as possible and really embrace co-creation, not just with your partners, your technical partners, um, perhaps there's government partners, perhaps there's private sector partners that's building out the business ecosystem that's required for the loan repayment to be successful, but also with the end users. Bring them into your process. We work at Heifer Labs, within Heifer International, we work with a lot of different kinds of technology verticals, not just blockchain. And the number one lesson that we've learned is that you have to include the end user as part of your design process. You create an environment where they can feel that they are are part of the solution and the adoption curve is much easier to climb. And I like to say often that the problem really isn't the technology. Building out the tech, we have the resources, the knowledge, and the capabilities to do that. But behavioral adoption of the new solution is the real heart of the challenge. And if you don't have that product market fit and you don't have a plan for behavioral adoption, the technology can be great, but it won't be used and it won't deliver the impact that you're looking for. True, true. To, to Gabriella's point about um, you know, falling in love with the problem, I think when we invest directly in these projects, um, we meet a lot of technologists who kind of see everything they could possibly do with technology. Look at all these fantastic features and things we could build. Um, and so we're, what we're really focused on in, in finding those, those key entrepreneurs who understand the, the high leverage but limited application of technology and that the rest of the problem solving is about the business model, the community, and the customer that you're serving, to your, to your point, Antoinette Marie. Um, and so like, it's not that we look for technology light or, th or, or, or small amounts in, in particular, but that it, there's a, a specific discipline for using technology where it's high, high leverage. So if you look at um, what Ethic Hub has built, um, the ability to repeatedly transact in a, in a loan format that is consistent and proven time and again, there's no additional cost to that contract. It's been created. It exists. It's essentially bulletproof at this point. It's been hammered on so many times. That will extend for 
a very, very long time. We hope to these extra zeros I keep talking about. Um, and so, you know, w when we think about like how to get to that to, to that start, it's really about getting right at the point of the thinnest possible um, amount of technology that gives you the highest leverage and can be repeated. One question is very interesting is like, what is the uh, the scale needed to adapt that technology and uh, in other markets? And the example was asked for Haiti. So like Haiti, 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 <laughs> exactly. So what is the scale that you say, okay, this is the enough scale to say, yeah, I'm disrupting and I'm, I have good traction. What is the, the amount of scale that says, if you reach that point, yes, it's good. Or if not, you have to drop it. Is there any? I, th I think I come at this little, a little bit of a different approach. Um, the technology needs to be scalable. Fortunately, software models usually are once they're built and there's a good product market fit. We look at scale more from a maturity perspective. So when is the right time to bring in tech in development contexts? Because the fundamentals need to be there. Um, our farmers need to be organized, they need to be operational, they need to be on their way to profitability. And then at that point, you start to think about how do we increase the efficiencies of their operations and provide them with what they need to be successful, like access to affordable capital. Sometimes it's really basic. like They need electricity. They need a place to work. Sometimes it's a little bit more advanced. They have paper-based accounting, and they need an ERP system that can help them digitize their operations and connect into a supply chain traceability platform. That would earn them a premium because they have provable origin um, that they can offer as an incentive to their buyers. So I think there's levels to it. And it's scalability is hand in hand with maturity and readiness. And the, the tricky part is figuring out what's that inflection point to go in and deliver a digital solution that can then do what software does, which is hopefully virally scale. You're good. Second one, like, uh, I'm, I prefer to use your question. So how you currently, or what do you see emerging for Web3 to encourage regenerative practice with farmers? What's emerging? Well, I think we're working on a site. People is uh, familiar with blockchain use for traceability, right? For traceability of items. Imagine that blockchain with a blended finance, we're talking about traceability of funds. If we can deliver enough funding for the farmers to keep their practices, that the regenerative practices, we will protect the way they produce food. And this is very, this is key because agriculture is key for climate change. Uh, and if farmers cannot make a living out of their agroforestry farming, they will cut down the trees, plant another crop like this is not suitable for the mountains, like corn, for example, so they can eat one, two years, and they, the heavy rains wash all the land down, and it's a desert, it's lost, and they migrate to the United States, in the case of Latin America. Let's reflect why such big countries as, as Mexico, our main source of income is remittances. When there's so much nature around that has to be taken care of, please think with me that the greenest areas of the planet is where the unbanked lived. Live. So it's very important to, to give a, a way of living in order to them to remain the stewards of the land. And we're talking about financial exclusion, but they are also excluded from the carbon markets. They are also excluded from the certification markets. The whole global system is not designed for the small scale. And it's very important to, to see that. So I invite you for the next time you designed a system, keep in mind the excluded to not keep uh, is, uh, repeating this, this problem. And reforestation, re sorry, regeneration is important because I think sustainability is about keeping things as they are. But we need to heal. We need to cover the holes that are done. So we need to regenerate to, to do more than what is done until now to make this sustainable and also to, to, think, to keep thinking about this. So all, the whole planet is connected. I, I use the terms that I heard because it's easier to explain about global north and global south, but I don't like it. It's not a north and a south. We are all together into this. So 
for those who have the privilege of eating three times a day, please think the enormous power your money has when you decide what to eat and to whom to buy it. And that makes a huge difference into the lives of millions of people and into the planet, of course. Maybe I can get a little geeky. I love what you were just saying, Gabriella. Um, um, when we're thinking about um, folks who have a natural connection to the land, um, you had mentioned that 80% of uh, cocoa farmers, for example, this is coming from two hectares or less of, of land. Um, and so you just do the quick math. That's tens of thousands of livelihoods of families of farmers who are working there. And so to take that to a technology conversation, blockchain is a grassroots technology. Um, it is distributed over the internet. It is open source. It is contributed to by a large community of many of the folks in this ecosystem, the Silicon Valley and around the world. Um, but it's fundamentally an, a, a grassroots technology. It is for everyone uh, can, can, can be uh, on, on the blockchain and, and access whatever smart contract you bring. So if it's one that um, allows you to get a loan to do you know, better work or invest more in your farm, um, that's accessible to everyone. Now, there is also that hurdle of adoption we've been talking about, but it's, it's fundamentally a, a, a bar to be cleared. And once that bar is cleared, you have a, a grassroots platform. And I think that's, from a technology perspective, really important to understand. So much of what we see in development, so much of what we see in impact is very large scale, top down, big development dollars coming out of governments, coming out of uh, large multinationals or NGOs. And in some applications, as we're seeing with Ethic Hub, the blockchain technology actually provides an equalizing factor where cooperatives and smallhold farmers can do for themselves with tools that have already been written and put out on the internet for them to access. So once we get them up over that hurdle, I feel very encouraged by the potential for the grassroots to grow. I'd like to add something to this, because they were talking about philanthropy at the beginning, and there's a lot of prejudice, thinking that helping others should be philanthropic or altruistic. It's not. This technology is proving it is possible to create shared value models because they are more efficient. Because when you can present from a third party as intermediary, when you can disintermediate and replicate and scale, it's business for everyone. It's a huge problem, but it's also a huge opportunity. And if we focus it as an investment opportunity and not as a donation, because it is not. I'm supposed to make a for-profit pitch. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'll make it is. It, it is. It's a, it is a good business to invest into into the common good. I want to add to that, and and I think this was part as I was planning for this talk. It was part of my closing remarks that even being a representative of the NGO, the philanthropic partner, we are very bullish on viable business solutions, blended finance, and private partnerships, because. For us to reach sustainable impact, the intervention needs to work when the grant dollars are no longer there. So once we're gone, it's the local businesses or the businesses that have been localized that remain. If you're relying on philanthropy to solve the problem, you're not going to get a sustainable solution. And there are always going to be asymmetries. Working with uh, rural producers, it, these are difficult, some of the world's most difficult challenges. But with this technology, there, there is a preconception that alternative finance is a disruptor. It's going to repay, uh, replace traditional finance. And I, I see it as a parallel. It's opening a different avenue, a parallel avenue by which those who are not served by traditional finance can be served. And it's great. We can have both, have traditional finance serve that it does and alternative finance opening new avenues for those who are excluded from formal financial systems. This suit, every time I speak, I'm sorry, I have to get, no, it's okay, good. <laughs> okay, I would say like this because the, the microphone, so I'm turn, turn. Um, two questions here, and one is they're interesting because like, we know we're preaching for people that believe in it. So one of the questions is okay, why there's so much resistance or why there's so much blockage? So what are the risks around it? Because not be that perfect. So 
resistance. I, I would answer human nature. We distrust what we don't understand. This is a very early stage of the of the web treat of the blockchain technology. Remember when we start using internet for payments? Most of us had a different card to use it in the internet because we were worried our data was going to be stolen and all that stuff that we now take for granted. So I think the challenge is adoption and we need more use cases to explain how the technology can be used for, for purposeful things. And I, I think that's, that's the main challenge. Get to know it, get a, embrace the unknown, learn about it, don't distrust, don't say no because you don't know it. Give it a, a try, give it a chance to understand what it's uh, good for, and not just to hear what the bad press is saying, because it it happened with all the other technologies. It always happens. It's the same curve of adoption, I think. Yeah. I'm just add a follow up question. If I, do you want to add something? And Bill, I'm, I'm going to shoot a follow up question on this. It's really like okay. So related to this, are we going to see a crash like 2008, a like bubble like uh, that happened on this? Like, are we going to see? That's a follow-up question, Harris. No, I mean, just to be straightforward. I mean, this is, um, you know, it's kind of like saying um, blockchain is maybe equivalent to a, a category like music. Um, you can find a lot of terrible music in the world, so you can find a, t a lot of terrible blockchain projects as well. Um, and so, when you have a proven platform, I think this is why. Um, you know, when you look at a project like Ethic Hub with a with a five year track record, with um, you can go on if you're technical, you can actually look up their smart contract on a blockchain explorer and see the transactions. You can also go to their website and see the real lives of people that have been uh, that have been touched and improved by um, the loans that you make. And and I would say, you know, take the risk that you can take. It is is an investment product to some extent. So um, you've heard that $4 million have been loaned and returned. You've heard that the um, the uh, the rate there um, uh, of, uh, of repayment is 99%. Um, and that is then they have a blended model so that that actually doesn't impact um, any investor. Take your risk capital and put it to work. Um, if you buy a CD for four. 0.25% return on an annual basis right now. Um, you can actually find a different interest rate by helping farmers with a loan on this platform. So um, I think the answer is no, it's a very, this is a very specific and proven project and we need that. We need more specific and proven projects. Um, we'll start to see more folks like Ethic Hub and Heifer working with, with people and we'll see that there's probably an extension of what you've built that others, and when it comes to maybe carbon crediting or, or other things that we'll see in the future, where you'll become the center of trust and accelerate things. That's one of the amazing things about the technology. It's composability. It's like blocks that can be combined. We don't need to start from scratch. The technology is evolving very fast. So very soon, most of the implementations we need, we can build them because it's our founding team, which is technicians, uh, technicals, but it can be uh, adopted for, for many and per, per, uh, apported by many. Um, we just have a few minutes left, so like, I'm gonna, I just have like, uh, moving to the closing, like, the, f the first question I have is, what is your biggest fear related to your field, and what's happening if you have one biggest fear, what it is? Is it a fear or is it an opportunity? I'd say it's an opportunity. Um, I think that the, the gap or the divide between the philanthropic space and the impact investing or social enterprise space is getting smaller and it, that trend needs to continue. We really need to work hand in hand to understand the development challenges and the maturity that's required for investors to come in with a healthy risk appetite and work hand in hand to create viable and sustainable solutions. It's difficult because the challenges that we're working to solve are difficult and they require patient and flexible capital. And they require time and thoughtful data collection in order to not prove out that it's working, that's important too, but also to influence and help the programming pivot together with the private entities. So we have to work together to make our programs better and we have to be really humble about what's working and what's not working, discard what's not working and innovate again to find what can work for the long term. I'm an optimist through and through. Uh, and so I think um, 
maybe maybe just um, impatience and anxiety rather than fear. So uh, it's, uh, my emotional state is, um, come on already, folk. I mean, like we've proven it, right? It's working. Um, so I, uh, it's really about just, I want to just see more and more adoption, more. I would love for half of the folks in this audience today to get on to Ethic Hub and try uh, and, and explore and, and put something down that can be massively impactful in the next five hours five to 10 minutes, it can, it can literally happen that quickly. Um, and if you don't, or if you need help doing that, I'd love to chat with you about it. So let's move fast. Also, I'm quite optimistic, but if there's a fear, could be that people, sorry, uh, that I'm optimistic also. And if I have a fear regarding the technology, would be that people here doesn't act fast enough. And instead of having the amazing tool it is to catalyze uh, a development for the for the SDGs, yeah, we end up with a Wall Street on steroids. I mean, the technology being used to do the same business as usual, faster, cheaper, but the same, instead of creating whole new models. Imagine uh, e-marketing, e or how it was before when they said you need to use catalogs to do stuff no? instead of using the technology. It's going to be the same. This is an amazing new model. This is just a starting. And I invite you to embrace this technology and adopt it and, of course, join Epic Hub to learn how to use it for purposeful things and not to do the same as usual. And quickly, your biggest hope. I'll just, um, I'll just say that we meet and connect with more incredible folks like Heifer and, and Ethic Hub. I think um, just getting the word out there that this is there's potential here that we've proven a model that works. Um, I hope to use that word that more entrepreneurs, more builders, um, and more NGOs are inspired to to come down this path. Yeah, my biggest hope. They said Web two Internet. It's about competitors while Web3, it's about collaborators. My greatest hope is to create synergies between the world changers, the game changers, that want to do something positive and do it now, not to wait to that future. It is in our little hands to do huge things, and we can do it all together. I hope to find um, more ethic hubs more builders who are looking at very viable use cases and they're talking about their impact, and they're using the technologies available to them. A couple of years ago, it was blockchain and smart contracts. Now it's all about AI. Let's use all the tools that we have at our disposal to work on solutions that can create an impact. And just to close, last one. Like, there's so many good information that was shared. What is the one-liner that you want them to keep in mind? Like, what's the one, the next morning, top title in the newspaper, the headline. What will it be for people to live with? So, okay, I need to live with this one. One takeaway they need to go with. I'm just going to summarize what I said before. Take a risk at making an impact. Perfect. Be brave. We, knew, we need new ways to solve old problems. Take a risk, be brave, and keep innovating.